Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. I'll be reading from New King James Version. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in the epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be a shame. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is signed in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, it's always um, exciting to come to the Word of God, and it's a kind of bittersweet time because we come to the end of Second Thessalonians. If you've received a letter from someone whom you love, you like, you'd like to read the letter, perhaps not just once, but a few times, and every time you come to the end of the letter, you feel sad that you have to end the letter and finish reading it. So you go back and read it again from the beginning, perhaps a few times. You might even keep the letter in a safe place and go back to the letter from time to time. And if you have written or received a love letter, uh, when you are courting with your you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, you might have that experience. And Paul's writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica, and Thessalonian people must have felt like that as they came to the end of this short but sweet letter. Now, when was the last time you wrote a paper letter? Now, we live in an email generation that we rarely write things with pen or pencil on paper. You type instead. And sometimes, well, nowadays, uh, not even typing, you tap on the screen and just write a few words and a few sentences. It is rather difficult to write anything lengthy with um, screen keyboards. Uh, if you have proper keyboards, you might write something, but that's very different from writing uh, in ink um, on paper. But there was a time, I even remember that, um, when you have to sit down with a paper and pen in your hand and think about what you're going to write and write. And if you make a mistake, you might sometimes have to write from the beginning all over again because you write with ink and you can't erase that. You can't go back and delete like you do on computer screen. And Paul's writing this letter. He comes to the end, and he's now, he's now giving them a kind of um, salutation or concluding remark. He began with a greeting. Now, this is a very formal letter in a sense because it follows very predictable format that they used to use at the time. And it's a rare thing for us to write a formal letter nowadays, unless you're working, I suppose, I'm in business world or some legal profession where you have to write something very formal and start with an introduction and you've got the content and you've got the conclusion. When it comes to personal letters, we rarely write in formal format. But Paul is, fo Paul is following a very formal and very predictable format in accordance with the style of those days. And he comes to the last part where he's now kind of giving them a summary of his letter and writing final salutation. So as he's nearing the end of the letter, he is kind of giving them some important messages um, and reminding them of um, what he had said. So let's get into the letter and see how he ends his letter. Actually, there are quite a lot of things that are implied here. Um, and we can spend a lot more time to go through the things that Paul is saying to them that they would understand, that we may not understand, because they knew what Paul was saying, but we have to um, kind of understand the implications and, and we have to dig out some um, nuances and, and common understand, understandings that they had that we don't have to make the full meaning out of this um, writing that he's, he's writing here. But we'll do as much as we can um, and make some sense out of um, Paul's concluding remark in his letter. Now remember that Thessalonian church was under some heavy persecution. So they needed um, very desperately some comforting encouragement and strengthening. So Paul has done that 
um, at the beginning in chapter 1. I know that you are under heavy persecution, but endure that. Because this persecution is temporary. There will be a time when the Lord will come and we enter into eternity where there is no more suffering. So if you endure that, then all will be well. And I understand how difficult it is for you to go through persecution. And what wasn't really helpful at the time was um, these false teachers who came and taught them some false teaching about the end times. Some of them were saying, look, Christ has already come. The church has already been raptured and you missed out. Maybe Jesus gave up on you. Maybe you were neglected. You missed out on that blessing of taken, being taken up to heaven. So they were worried and they were concerned. Then what about us? Will we be raptured um, again? Or what about those people who died in faith who have not resurrected? So there were all these false teachings and confusions. So Paul spends quite some time in chapter 2 talking about what we call eschatology, doctrines about the end times. And he said clearly, look, the end hasn't come yet. Christ hasn't come back yet. For that to happen, first you have to see the Antichrist. Antichrist hasn't come yet. Yes, there are spirits of Antichrist. Now, there are all these teachings and practices that are against Christ, which is the doctrine of Antichrist. But the Antichrist, the, the person Antichrist will come in the tribulation, has not come yet because he hasn't come yet, Christ hasn't come yet, and there's no need to worry about rapture. It hasn't taken place yet. So Paul's comforting them without giving them too much doctrine or some theology. He's simply giving them some pastoral counseling that all is well. And then when it comes to chapter 3, as we saw during the past few weeks, he in fact um, um, rebuked some of them, and especially those who did not work, even though they had to work, but they were busybodies. They were going around and um, spreading rumors and saying things that were not really helpful. Um, the ancient Greek culture and Roman culture didn't really help because they had all these slaves who were doing the manual labor. So there were some people who were kind of um, spending very comfortable time. If you especially had some money, then you could simply uh, flaunt your wealth and use all these slaves to do the hard work and you can be comfortable. Not only that, um, this is more outside the church than inside the church. Some people were using their wealth and slaves to do things that were immoral, things that were even illegal. And they were doing that without much thought. And influenced by that practice, people in the church were saying, well, especially if Jesus is coming soon, why bother to work? We don't need to work. We can quit our work. We can sell all things and just enjoy our life or even uh, come to church and be spiritual and so on. So there were all kinds of um, false um, and disorderly uh, teaching and lifestyle among some of them. So Paul said, look, that's not right. Whether the Lord is coming soon or a little bit later, we ought to work. He said, if you are not working, if you don't work, then you should not eat either. Which simply means that if you don't work, you die. No food, starve to death. So he says, you need to work as a Christian. You need to work diligently and faithfully. As long as it is um, moral and not against the Bible or Christian ethics or Christian beliefs, then you can go and work whatever it is. Even Paul himself set an example by working as a tent maker. Not all the time, but when he needed, he was working as a tent maker or leather worker and supported himself and those who were working with him. And also, um, he said, I did this to actually set an example for you so that you would follow that example of um, work. So we talked about some Christian work ethics last week. And then he says in verse 13, but as for you, brethren, first of all, he says, do not grow weary. Now notice that there are phrases like, do not grow weary in doing good. And he says things like, the Lord of peace in verse 16, and also the Lord be with you all. He says in verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now from these phrases, we can see that Paul is speaking with very um, pastoral and warm tone. He's not kind of warning them like he did with Corinthian church. He's not rebuking them as he did with Ephesian church even, but he's simply giving them warm pastoral counseling and admonition. 
It's like the pastor writing to the flock whom he loves. So first, he says this. Let's have a look at this. And then there are about three points that we can observe here. First is this. Do not grow weary in doing good. Now this has to be very encouraging and, and sustaining advice. Do not grow weary in doing good. Have you noticed that this world is not always fair? Sometimes good people suffer and bad people seem to prosper. I mean, there are times when you probably waited for the green light to come at the, cross, at the crossing where um, you know, other people are simply ignoring the sign and then crossing the road when it's a red light. You might think, well, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm suffering because I'm losing my time. Others are crossing. But you kind of persevere and you insist doing the right thing. Sometimes it is rewarded. Sometimes it is not rewarded. You try to do the right thing and not lie on you know, tax return applications or even um, when it comes to writing some forms. Um, sometimes that honesty might be rewarded. Sometimes you might even uh, incur more loss or more cost. It seems that sometimes people who lie and people who do the wrong things profit more and they get away with whatever that they do that is wrong. But for Christians, we know that we are to do the good thing and we should not grow weary in doing so. Now we'll come to what it really means uh, by good here. But first of all, it says do not grow weary. In other words, we can sum that up in one word, persevere. Persevere or endure. If you're doing good, then keep on going. Keep on going because you're doing the right thing. Now, immediate context of this expression, this admonition, um, tells us this. What, what does Paul mean by doing good? In the immediate context, he's referring to everything that he had said before. Like endure persecution, uh, keep up the right teaching, you know, resist all this false teaching about the end times. And also when it comes to work, go and do, do the work, uh, labor, and, and get work and, and get paid by doing that. Do the, do the right thing. Just go on with your normal day-to-day -day living. So all these good things keep on doing and do not grow weary. But as human beings, we can't help but to get weary when we do things for an extended time. We become tired, sometimes not, as, uh, not, not just in physical terms, but in mental terms as well. Sometimes we become very um, exhausted mentally, psychologically, even physically, and we lose strength to push ourselves. Sometimes we want to give up. Sometimes we grow so weary that we simply want to quit all. But the advice here is, do not grow weary in doing good. And let's unravel that just a little bit to help you. Now, first of all, what is good? What is good? In larger context, this good simply means doing things according to God's will. In fact, if you look at the word good, in Greek word kalos, it's inherently good things. It is not simply moral good, but it is more than that. As Christians, it is good, it is beautiful, and it is right, and it is good in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, anything and everything that you do in accordance with the will of God is good. Conversely, anything and everything that you do against the will of God is not good and evil. We call that evil. So, for now, you need to set aside our human preconception about good and evil. And we think that good is good, morally good, and evil is really terrible, heinous, immoral things. But biblical good is a little bit more than that. You may be doing something that is moral, but evil in God's sight. For example, there's nothing immoral about not coming to church. There's nothing immoral about not reading the Bible. There's nothing immoral, worldly speaking, uh, from worldly perspective, about not praying, for example. But 
not doing any of these things is not good in the eyes of God. God commands to read the scripture, pray, and come together for fellowship. So there are some things that are neither moral nor immoral, but yet it may be not good in the sight of God. And of course, there are things that are good, but those good things may be contrary to the secular law. In countries like communist countries, reading the Bible may be illegal. Coming together as Christians may be illegal, but it is good. It's what we have to do as Christians, regardless of what the world might say. God's authority comes first before the world's authority. So when you talk about good in the Bible, you must understand that this is good according to the standard of God. Not just your own thoughts, human opinions, or worldly popular standard. It is according to the word of God. Just think of it in this way. There are basically two ways you can see this. There are positive and there are negative. In other words, good includes not doing the things that the Bible says not to do. So when the Bible prohibits or forbids, you don't do it. The Bible says don't steal. If you used to steal and you became a Christian, no, you don't continue stealing as a thief and a Christian. If you become a Christian, you quit stealing. So if you see the Bible saying to you, don't do certain things, you don't do it. That's good. On the other hand, the Bible says, do certain things. Like do read the Bible, pray, do preach the gospel, uh, do gather together, assemble together as Christians. And we do the things that the Bible commands us to do. They're, they're the positive things. So when it comes to negative they are concerned with moral laws, usually. And when it comes to positive, they're concerned with spiritual commands that we have to do. So if the Bible says do, do it. That's good. If the Bible says don't, you don't do it. And that's good. So if you do the things that the Bible says not to do, then that's bad. If you don't do the things that the Bible says to do, that's also bad. Indeed, in James chapter 4, verse 17, James says clearly, if you know how to do good and don't do it, to him it is sin. The word is sin. If you look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter says, Jesus came and Jesus of Nazareth went around doing good. It simply says Jesus went around and he did good. What did he mean? Did he mean that Jesus went around and did some charitable deeds, help the poor people, feed the hungry, uh, give water to those who are thirsty? Maybe. But in that context, doing good was to preach the gospel. It is to give the message of salvation to people so that people could turn from sin and come to Christ. That is indeed the best work that you can do out of all the good works, to preach the gospel that brings the greatest joy in heaven and to God. So whether it is good or um, whether it is not good, that does not depend on human opinion. We have to be clear on that. That does not depend on the worldly view, but it depends on the word of God. So always go back to the Bible and see if it is good according to the Bible. And secondly, if you know that you're doing good according to the Bible, there is no need to grow weary. Keep on going. It may be that you are doing good for the rest of your life and you might not see the fruit of that during your lifetime. That's possible. And yet, if you keep on doing good, then the Lord will make sure that your labor is not in vain. Indeed, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, he says, your labor is not in vain. So keep abounding in the labor and the work of the Lord. Keep abounding in your work that you do for the Lord. So how long, how long do we persevere? How long do we keep on doing good without growing weary? Well, as long as you can, as long as you can. There was once a pastor who was preaching in a small church and he was doing a revival for about a couple of weeks in England. 
And um, it was a small gathering, only a handful of people, and there was no newcomer other than a little child. But nonetheless, he persevered and he preached the gospel. And afterwards, he met with his friend pastor and said, um, well, you know, I preached this revival in our church, but I'm very disheartened. I, I was very discouraged because there was no one who came other than this little kid. But after some time, you know, many, many years after, this little child who came to that revival was converted by that pastor's ministry. And he later became a missionary in Africa and preached the gospel to many people. And you might know the name of that child, um, David Livingston. That pastor who preached in that lonely revival might not have seen that fruit, fruit of his labor, but the Lord made sure that that labor was not in vain. And often we hear the stories of people praying. I pray for my, uh, my family member. I pray for my friend who is not yet saved. You pray for the person's salvation and you keep on preaching the message. And that may not happen in that lifetime, during that lifetime of the person who's preaching the gospel. But I've heard stories when um, the person, after the person passes away, the person um, who is on the receiving end of the gospel becomes saved. And then realizes that it was due to the prayer and effort and labor of the person who had passed away. Sometimes that's God's plan. Sometimes you might see the fruit of your labor. Now hold on to this, put a bookmark in Second Thessalonians, and if you have your Bibles, just go back to Galatians 6, 9. This is also a very encouraging word that you can remember alongside this verse in Second Thessalonians. So look at chapter, nine, chapter 6, verse 9, Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9. It's pretty much the same thing. And Paul says in this verse, this. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For because in due season, in due time, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So Paul's consolation to any of you who is persevering while doing good and may not see the results straight away is to not lose heart, not grow weary, but keep on going. Persevere. And we sometimes need to look beyond earthly, temporal world because your perseverance now will determine your eternity. Your eternity depends on the present. What you do now and how you live your life has eternal consequence. And as Christians, we know that there is eternity. So you don't simply live your life thinking about five years and ten years from now on. Well, that's also necessary. You need to make plans and you need to do the things now so that you have better future in 5 or 10 or 20 years from now. But you also think about your eternity and think about how you live your life now at the present time because your present life determines your future and even eternity. So the question is, just going back to our text, do not grow weary in doing good in Galatians because in due season you'll reap the reward. So do not lose heart. The question is, are you doing good? Are you doing good according to God's standard? Not according to your own thoughts. Maybe another question, if you find the question a little difficult to answer, am I doing good? I'm not so sure. You know, I think you need to ask, then what are you doing? What are you doing? We fill our time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with doing things. It may be your job. Well, the Bible says we saw that work is good. If you are working in your job, it's good. But of course, we talked about this last week. But if your job, your work, takes your heart away so much that you're losing spiritually, then that's not so helpful. So that's one extreme. Work is work. Uh, for the purpose of make a living out of that, but not beyond that. It shouldn't be your idol. It shouldn't be something that t 
taxes, um, that is so taxing that it, it robs your energy and your attention so much that you can't even devote yourself to the things of God, that that's not good. But work itself is good. The Bible says, well, God commanded Adam and Eve to work, and God commands us to work. So it may be your work. It may be your duty as husband or father, wife. It may be that you have some ministry responsibility in the church, and you're doing good. But sometimes you might not see the end. You know, how long do I have to do this? You know, will I see any fruit of this labor? Is there any point in doing this? When it comes to questions like that, it's not very helpful to be pragmatic, and that is to say that it's not very helpful to see the result and work for the result, immediate result or visible result, but you need to look at the standard of God and see in principle that you are doing good according to the standard of God in the Bible. And if you are, then don't grow weary. Do not lose heart. In due season, whether in this world or in eternity, you will reap reward for your labor. Your labor is never in vain. That's what the Bible says. And if there's anything that you need to trust, it's the Bible, the Word of God. And when you trust this truth, and when you have confidence that the Word of God is always true and holds true, then you can also obey this command. Do not grow weary in doing good. So maybe now or even in the future, if you find yourself kind of becoming a little weary and, and tired and exhausted from whatever it is that you're doing, then go back and read this text and think about what you're doing. If you're doing good, there's no need to grow weary. Of course, if you're not doing good, then that's the time to, to change and, and fix. Make sure that you're doing good according to God's will. And it's not that difficult to discern whether what you're doing is good or not good according to the Bible. It's not that hard. And um, if it's difficult for you to alone um, discern that, then you've got other Christians whom you can talk with. Um, you can ask for counsel, advice, look at the Bible, pray. And I'm sure that if you search and seek and ask, it'll be given to you, it'll be open to you, and you shall find. Now second, so do not grow weary in doing good. In verse 14, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, and we're back in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, then note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Now what's Paul talking about here? Now, of course, the first of all, he says, if anyone does not obey. So implication is, you need to obey this. You need to obey all the word in this epistle. All the things we have written to you about your persecution and the need to endure and, and the need to work and about the, uh, the eschatology, the end times and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to obey these commands in this epistle. Obedience. So persevere first. Second, obedience. And if anyone does not obey, then Paul says, do this. Now, what authority did Paul have to say this? Now, Paul's speaking here with his apostolic authority. Now, he was one of the apostles, um, not the 12, but he was, you can say, the 13th apostle. He was the, uh, the additional apostle, apostle especially chosen by Christ himself to preach the gospel not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles mainly afterwards. So as an apostle appointed by Christ himself, he is now speaking to the church in Thessalonica with his authority that if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, then note that person, do not keep company with him, let him be ashamed. And Paul is basically talking about what you might call church discipline. Church discipline. Now, what is church discipline? Now, Paul's writing to a church that is rather young. And church discipline, you might think, um, is not really appropriate for a young church like this. But let me kind of you know, cram it and then give you, uh, in a nutshell, what church discipline is according to the Bible. Now, the church discipline that 
word specifically does not appear in the Bible. The word discipline is used, but the church discipline is a composite word that we make up from the, the lessons in the Bible as a kind of term that mean that. But basically, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, if any brother or sister is sinning or in sin, in other words, dis disobeying the word of God, then you need to go to the person privately first and tell the person about whatever that person is doing wrong. If he or she listens to you, then good. There's no more need to go any further. If not, then take one or two witnesses and tell the person the same thing. Of course, you've got the pressure now from two or three people. And if the person doesn't listen to the two to three people, one or two witnesses and plus yourself, then you tell it to the church. And then the church tells the person in question. And if the person refuses even to listen to the church, then you need to put him or her outside the church. And that's to kind of, you might use the word excommunicate or put him out of the church, put him out of the fellowship. But basically it is to what Paul says here, do not keep company and note the person and you know, don't, don't fellowship with the person. So that's in a nutshell church, church discipline. You might say there are three steps or four steps. Um, but essentially, it is to approach personally, privately, and secondly, take witnesses, and thirdly, tell it to the church. And if um, they, the person doesn't listen to the church, then the person is put outside the fellowship. That might be the final and fourth step. And it's quite likely that Paul had already gone through that with the church, um, possibly when he was with the church before um, writing this letter. So he doesn't need to say that um, in a very detailed way. He simply has to say, look, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, then note that person and do not keep company with him so that he may be ashamed. And he says this with apostolic authority. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says to the Corinthian church, now if there's anyone who is in terrible sin like sexual immorality or even um, you know, stealing, uh, theft and, and covetousness, all kinds of these um, sins that are uh, common with unbelieving bad people, but not so with Christians. But if anyone in the church is doing that, then Paul says, do not even eat with him or her. Don't keep company with that person, but obviously um, that's, that's uh, the right thing to do. But Paul says, do not even eat, because eating symbolizes fellowship. So no fellowship, not eating together, not communing together. So that basically is what we call church discipline. And Paul says, if anyone does not listen to our word in this epistle, then do this. And he's now saying this to a young church. Again, if we think about our human logic or simply um, you know, our personal opinions, we might think, well, that's a little too harsh, isn't it? We might think um, church is a place where everybody should be welcomed. Um, yes, we make mistakes and do things that are sinful and not right. But if we, if we actually are not such a person and not keep, keep company with the person, then would, wouldn't we scare the people out of the church and um, lose the people in the church? And as a young church, I'm sure the church was growing and they had a lot of people by now, but still as a young church, that sounds a little harsh and sometimes a little strict. And uh, we might think that church should be a little bit more um, kinder uh, place to come. But again, that's our thought. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible teach um, about church discipline? Yes. Does the Bible say that this is what we ought to do? Yes. So, according to the Bible, this is good. In fact, to disregard sin is not good. To let sin go untold or unnoticed or even un. Um, disciplined is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches clearly that this is what we do. And, and we can spend more time some other time. And it, this is for the purpose of keeping the church pure and clean. 
This is also to uh, uphold the teaching of the Bible. This is in pursuit of godliness and sanctification. This is all in line with that. And this is the Lord's will for his own church. But again here, Paul adds in verse 15, Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So why do you do this? Why do you take a note of him or her and not keep company with the person? Why would you make that person ashamed even? To be ashamed in a church? That sounds a little out of place in our own thoughts, but that's what the Bible says. Why? Because we want him or her to remain as a brother or sister in Christ. In other words, we want to draw people in. And as people are drawn into the church, we want those people to be sanctified. And without being sanctified, if you harbor sin and if you tolerate sin and continue with sin, then that's not consistent with what the church is. So the purpose is to collectively keep the purity of the church, but individually to bring people into the church and keep them there and keep them sanctified and to encourage people, you know, Christians, to be more like godly and Christ-like. After all, that's what the church does, isn't it? When you go to church and if you don't change at all and if you're the same person as you were before you came to church, then what is the point of going to church? So Paul says, if anyone does not obey our word, then note that person, which includes all these steps that we take for church discipline, and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. But do it so that the person is... Um, he is one back into the fellowship. So admonish him as a brother, not as someone who is an enemy of the gospel. So thirdly, we can see from verse 15, the issue is fellowship. So Paul says in this concluding remark, persevere. Keep doing good. Do not grow weary. And second, obey the word of God. Obey the word in this epistle. If anyone does not obey, then... The fellowship is cut off because what's important is Christian fellowship in the church. So fellowship is the third message here. Then when it comes to church discipline, it says, again, um, going back to verse 15, admonish him as a brother. Now it may be in um, some situations the person is in sin, um, but still the person may continue in fellowship there are times when the person needs to be cast out of the church or excommunicated from the church, but there are times when the person may still haven't repented fully, but can stay in the church as long as the person doesn't cause um, big problems or, or serious um, implications. And you keep admonishing that person as a brother or sister in Christ, and you give them the person the blessing of fellowship. We also have to note that um, someone who is in important ministry role um, may not continue in that role, but continue in fellowship. In other words, say that you've got a pastor or a leader in the church who uh, falls into some sort of sin or disobedience, and the person doesn't listen to the church, church's admonition. And the person may continue attending the church and come to fellowship, but it may well be that the person needs to step down from the role as a leader or as a pastor of the church because you just cannot expect to lead or teach or pastor the church while you're not setting an example in obedience. So uh, we understand that there are implications and there are some steps that need to be taken, but ultimately we want the person to remain in fellowship and we want that person to repent from sin and one back into the fellowship. So this is all for what we call restoration. Church discipline, uh, is aim, the, the, the aim of the church discipline is to restore the brother or sister into fellowship. And in Matthew 18, it says that if um, the person repents, then you have gained a brother or a sister in Christ. So that's a gain to the church. And this all tells us about the importance of Christian fellowship. It is about being together. 
It is about being present with each other. It is to gather together. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Do not forsake the assembling of the saints, because people will do that as the last day approaches. And we feel that. The, the uh, more we go on with our life, the, the life becomes busier and busier, and it is so easy to forsake the assembling of the saints. And we get together once or twice a week, and even that we struggle to, to make. The Bible says, assemble together as often as we can. The early church came together almost on a daily basis, and the Lord added to them those who were being saved on a daily basis. In modern time, that may not be practical, and yet we struggle to come to church even sometimes once or twice a week. When I think about that, I mean, just using our common logic from the Bible, it's almost like this. You come to church on Sunday and you spend the rest of the week, and we'd love to have some fellowship, some connection uh, during the week, but sometimes we are too busy and we just go on living our lives throughout the week and then come back on the church on, on, the, on Sunday. And, and to me, it looks like all these weekdays, Monday through to Saturday, all, these week, all those weekdays are like long, thin, fragile bridge that is barely suspended between the two pillars of Sundays. If you make it, you come to church on Sundays and you kind of stand on firm ground of that pillar. And you begin your Monday, your week, work week, and often we, we are walking on that fragile bridge, hopefully making it to the other end by next Sunday. For some of us, we have the blessing and privilege of coming together on Wednesdays um, as, as leaders, and the bridge is not so short. It's only two or three days, so you spend two or three days and then you come back together, and that's when you're encouraged, you're nourished, you're strengthened, you're established, all of that. And then you go on another two or three days and then you come on Sunday again. But for many of us, unfortunately, and many other people in churches, in other churches, they go on from Monday to Saturday without coming in contact with fellow Christians or without spending some solid time in the Word and fellowship. Hopefully, they can, you know, with the hope they can make it to the next Sunday, but that may not even happen. The Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of the saints. So it is very important for Christians to get together. There was a man called um, Bonhoeffer in Germany during the Second World War. He was a pastor. He wrote a lot, and uh, he was a faithful pastor, even though he was a German, because he was a Christian. He was imprisoned by German authorities, by the Nazis. When he was incarcerated in the prison, sometimes he was in solitary confinement, he wrote from that prison about fellowship and how he longed for that Christian fellowship. He wrote a book on fellowship, or Christian fellowship, and he sorely missed that fellowship because he was cut off from that fellowship as he was spending his days in his prison. He later was executed, but his writings survived. And you can see how he loved fellowship with the saints. I mean, we're not in that dire, straight, desperate situation like him, but nonetheless, isn't that how we should feel during the week? Missing that fellowship, longing to see each other, and wanting to be present with other Christians, to serve the church, serve each other, to fellowship with one another, to share blessing of God together, to study the Bible together, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, just to spend time together. Yes, it's difficult with our busy schedule, but shouldn't we at least fight against that and find the time to do this? Because this is doing good. This is doing good. We shouldn't grow weary in doing this. And we should not lose heart in doing this. And keep on going. Keep on going. Because our eternity depends on it. So after t telling them about perseverance, obedience, and fellowship, he gives them final benediction here. And let's look at that and draw a conclusion here. In verse 16, Now, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. 
Now, just to note about benediction. We hear blessings or benediction. Benediction simply means blessing. Um, I can pray for you and pray, pray for blessing. You know, you can pray for each other and pray for God's blessing. But whether you receive the blessing or not does not solely depend on the person's prayer. Let me say that in, in this way. You will receive blessing if you deserve blessing. Of course, people can pray for blessing on you, and that prayer is good. The Bible says, you know, pray for blessing. And if it doesn't go to the person, then it let it come back to you. So when you pray for blessing for others, it's good because the person can receive it if he or she deserves it. If not, then it will come back to you. But whether the person receives the blessing or not does not depend completely on the person who prays for the person, the second person. It depends on whether you deserve blessing or not. And blessing comes with obedience. In other words, you deserve blessing if you obey the word of God. So no matter how good the benediction is in the Bible or from anyone else who prays for you, if you want to um, experience the benefit of that blessing, if you want to receive this blessing, then it is up to you whether you obey the word of God or not. If you don't obey, then even though it is all written here, it is all prayed for you, you are deflecting that blessing. If you obey the word of God, then you are receiving that blessing in full strength. And here he says, the Lord of peace. Now that's important, Lord of peace. Lord of peace. Sometimes how we long for peace in our life. Your mind may be very unsettled. Your mind may be very chaotic. Very distressed because of some things happening in your life. Because of some people in your life. And you want peace. It says, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of peace. The Lord of peace, the one who is the owner and master of peace himself, give you peace always, in every way. Notice that, always, all the time, in every way. And there's no gap here. Paul is saying, look, the Lord of peace can give you peace in every way, always, whatever you're going through. And what are they going through? Persecution, false teaching, all these erroneous teaching about work, and the coming of the Lord. And yet, Paul says, the Lord of peace can give you peace, always, in every situation. Now, in fact, the divine peace, this kind of peace, begins with receiving peace and redemption and salvation. If you know you're going to heaven, whatever happens, you have peace. You also can enjoy peace in your life as you Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and not grow weary in doing good and obey the word of God. And often, this peace comes to you not because the circumstances change. This peace comes to you because you receive peace into your heart from the Lord of peace himself. You change your perspective. You see things differently. And because you become stronger, you become broad in your heart, you become even more capable, let's say, capable of handling stresses and distresses, you have peace. It's almost like you have the vast ocean and that ocean cannot be unsettled by throwing a little stone. If you're a little pond, if you have a bowl of water, even a little stone you throw into that bowl will splash and water will spill out. If you have a big pond, if you have even vast ocean, you might drop a rock. It doesn't affect anything. It stays still. And the Lord of peace can give you peace in every way, always. With obedience, with trust and having confidence in his word, you can enjoy this peace. Remember what Jesus said when he rose from the dead? When he came to the disciples, as they were fearing and trembling because Roman authorities were about to arrest them, they had locked the door and Jesus appeared in the middle of them and said, Peace be with you. Peace be unto you. Almost every time he appeared before them, after the resurrection, 
He said, peace be with you. And peace is the result of God's grace. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, verse 18. That's basically complementing verse 16, benediction about peace. And there's little interesting comment in verse 17. Just for the sake of going through every verse, let's look at verse 17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write. Now Paul often had another person write his letters. It's likely that he had very bad eyesight. He was writing in a very large letters because he couldn't see clearly and he didn't um, have glasses like we can have now. And because um, writing large letters was not very practical, he often was um, writing these letters through the hands of, we might call them amanuensis, people who are writing for others. But when it came to the end of that letter, he had to make sure that the recipients of his letters would know that this is from Paul himself. So almost like putting a signature, he was writing the end few sentences with his own handwriting. And in another place he said, I am writing with my large writing, because that's how his writing handwriting was. And in verse 17 he's doing that. The salutation of Paul with my own hand. So I'm writing, which is a sign in every epistle, and so it is with this one, so I write with my own handwriting here. So he concludes his letter. In verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now let's remember that um, as we end this letter, this was not just Paul's personal letter to the church in Thessalonica. What does the Bible say in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? All scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, all these words that Paul wrote, Peter wrote, even Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, the Old Testament writers, prophets wrote, all these books were written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wrote through them. Of course, using their human agency. So it's not that these were written mechanically like some dictation, but they wrote from their own understanding, with their own vocabulary, with their own writing style, and yet the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write whatever they wrote. In other words, this is not only the letter from Paul, but this is the word of God that God wrote to us. It has full weight and authority of God himself and his word. He was writing this through Paul, and he's given them to the church of Thessalonica and us as well. So my question to you is, will you then cherish these words of God concerning the need to endure and persevere in doing good and be comforted in knowing that the Lord will return with justice and read these words again and again. Remind yourself of the truth again and again as often as necessary and be steadfast in keeping the word of God. Will you read and meditate again and again until the Lord comes? We sang a hymn just before we began our um, preaching and um, I think it was in Christ alone. There was a little phrase that said, um, Either the Lord will come again, if not, we will go to the Lord. So whether the Lord will return in our lifetime, or you might go to the Lord through your death, until such time when you meet the Lord and stand before him, we are to keep these words in our minds, in our hearts, and not grow weary in doing good. And when the church is full of those people, I'm sure the church will be blessed beyond measure, because that's the promise of God. Okay, let's all pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what an encouragement it was to go through this letter, Second Thessalonians, that Paul wrote to his dear people in Thessalonica. Now, these words were written for our benefit. So these words were not just read out to the church in Thessalonica some 2,000 years ago, but these words are ringing 
even in our ears as we read them to ourselves. And we thank you for the past several weeks that we spent in this letter, listening to Paul and listening to your word intended not only for the church in Thessalonica, but, but also us. And especially as we looked at the last part, we heard that important message of not growing weary in doing good, that we are to persevere, persevere for your benefit, for your glory, for your will, so that we can enjoy all the blessings that you promised us. Even though we may not see the result straight away, may we be patient and suffer long in doing good. And we need encouragement from you, and we need encouragement from each other. So may we stand by each other, not forsaking the assembling of the saints, but gather as often as we can, and encourage one another, motivate one another, and help one another, even serve and support one another, so that we can indeed do your will collectively as the body of Christ, the Church. And this all we will do according to the power that works in us, Lord. Help us in this regard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.